we will declare that the meeting minutes are approved. Um, we have one. Oh, I'm going to pass it back over to Marco for our introduction and COVID remarks. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trudy. Uh, again, good evening and welcome to the Park and Recreation Commission's June 20th uh, all virtual meeting. My name is Marco Rivero, the staff liaison to the PRC. I would like to remind, uh, remind our attendees that the PRC meeting will be recorded and that's beginning now. We ask that commissioners, presenters and attendees, please mute your microphones and turn off your video feeds if you are not speaking. For those attending via telephone, you can mute and unmute your microphones by dialing star six. The top toolbar contains a raise your hand function in case a commission member or presenter has a question during the meeting. Commissioners and presenters may share their screens using the share content box um, that's above. The chat box will also be checked routinely, uh, mainly to address any logistical, uh, logistical questions or issues during the meeting. And actually, since tonight we will be having a voting item, um, we will be tracking votes um, either on the chat or as part of a raise your hand function. So we'll, we'll be doing it that way. Um, as way of information, we'll be holding a public comment period at the beginning of the meeting. Each public commenter will have up to three minutes for public comment, and I will signal to the speaker once time is up. I believe we have Dr. Byrne on the line for the ARVA site plan. So what we'll do, Dr. Byrne, is we will have you uh, uh, provide public comment at the beginning of that item, and then uh, we'll move forward with presentation from the development team. Um, Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Shruti. All right, thank you. And so um, if are there any public commenters besides Dr. Byrne today? Not that have been signed up. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any on the line. Okay. I don't so, hear any. Uh, Bernie, is that okay with you? I'd love to have your item come right before the presentation. That way it's fresh on all of our minds, which is just going to be the second um, conversation that we have today. That's fine. I'll just wait till then. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, then we're going to push it to our first um, presentation for today. Max is going to be talking to us about the follow-up discussion on the naming of Highview Park. Um, and I mean, yeah, so pass over to Max. We're going to vote on this item today, guys, and subsequently write a letter on it. So, um, yes. Thank you, Max. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Um, are you all able to see my screen? Yes. OK, wonderful. Gonna go through the process. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Ewart. I'm an associate planner with the Department of Parks and Recreation, and I'm here today to discuss a proposal to rename the baseball field at Highview Park to Alfred Foreman Senior Field. Um, on the screen now is the field at Highview Park, named uh, or framed by North Dinwiddie Street to the west and North Cameron Street um, to the east. Um, as a recap of the county naming policy, um, the county naming policy requires that county facilities, including parks and, in this case, a facility in a park, shall be gener should generally be named according to the geographical, historical, or ecological relationship with the site. The Commission will seek comment from the JLRB and RNAC, which has already been done, um, and the appropriate neighborhood civic association. The applicant, the Halls Hill High View, Park Historic Preservation Coalition has reached out to the Highview Park Civic Association um, and they have uh, written a letter of support which has been submitted to um, the county board already. Um, the proposed facility name is to honor Alfred Foreman Sr., a native Arlingtonian who lived in the Highview Park neighborhood and whose family continues to live there. Alfred Foreman Sr. worked as a DPR employee for over 25 years, primarily working at the Langston Brown Community Center and was deeply involved in the athletics program at the nearby facility. Additionally, the Preservation Coalition are working with historic preservation staff to apply for a grant to have a marker erected in his honor. In the image on the right of the screen, the proposed banner with the field name is outlined in red, and the location for the marker would be outlined as in the location outlined in orangish yellowish. Um, uh, we have already worked with, we've already identified that this would not uh, require any additional maintenance budget um from pnr staff so uh, it would be a fairly um straightforward installation after the reception of the grant um, is confirmed 
As far as the milestones for this park, um, we have already come to the Park and Recreation Commission back in April. And since then, uh, we've gone to the Arlington Neighborhood Advisory Commission where they voiced their support for the project. However, they did not meet quorum um, and therefore did not have a formal vote. Um, and then at the Historic Affairs and Landmark Review Board meeting, they voted una unanimous, unanimously to support the, the recommendation. And now we are back here at the Park and Recreation Commission um, for the final recommendation by the PRC, um, both um, for the proposed uh, uh, baseball field name. Um, after this, I'll, we'll be attending the July County Board meeting for the official approval. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Sorry, my mouse has a latency. Okay, great, thank you, Max. So um, to everyone, we're going to be voting on this item um, now. Um, and so basically the roundup here is that we got signaling recommendations from our coordinating commissions that they support the changing of the park to Alfred Foreman Senior Field. We've heard about this before. Um, just So just to kick it off, like I'm, I think that this makes sense um, it is some precedence in naming the field this, which I think is interesting and cool. Um, but yes, I wanted to pass. I know when we originally talked about this, there were some questions, but um, any questions before we go into voting on the proposed name change? Go ahead, Colt. I just had a quick question about the monument. I didn't know... I mean, it looked like it was in key foul ground territory, and I was just wondering about a safety concern for its location, or is it a flat plaque? Um, it, the, the exact design hasn't been determined yet. Okay, um, okay. But it would be adjacent to the storage behind the field. Um, so it, it would be out of the okay. way and not, not be encumber any kind of like- yeah. um, No, I have no issue the with the naming. I was just curious about that, that feature. Yeah, and Thank we're you. going to be coordinating with our PNR staff to make sure it's located in the, in the ideal space. Thank you. Yep. All right. Okay, not hearing any other questions and seeing that all of our commissioners are joining us by phone and potentially video. Um, if you could please raise, I'm going to make a motion, and if you could please raise your hand either digitally or physically um, on, on camera, or sure. if you're only by phone, you can also uh, say it out. Um, so Trudy, Trudy yes. we, we need to, uh, so you just uh, made a motion to approve it. We need a second and then we can start, start okay. with the voting. All right, okay. So then motion to vote on the renaming of Highview Park uh, by Baseball Diamond. Can I please get a second to that? I second. Amazing. Sarah. Thank you. Sarah, and thank so you. all those in favor of the name change, please raise your hand. So I've got seven raised hands. I see Alex has his hand raised uh, virtually. So that's eight. Um, are we missing one person? Yes, I believe Dean. Dean, if you want to unmute yourself too, that's fine too. Oh, there we go. Dean raised his hand. All right, oh. now I'm going to ask you all to lower your hands. Um, but we have no opposed, right? That's all of us. Are there any opposed? Just trying to see if there's any hands that are... See. Dean's hand is up, but I think that's just a holdover. And Shruti, your hand's up, but I think that's a holdover Why as well. Letting not raise so I think it is unanimous. Yes, we're good. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, guys. Um, I will be writing a letter on this item since it'll be a quick one. Um, and so we'll talk about that at the end of the meeting. But thank you very much, Max, for bringing this to us. And thank you to commissioners for voting on this item. Um, thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, we're gonna swiftly move to our second plan and I know that the presenters are on the phone with us. So thank you for being here as well. 
Um, we're going to hear about the ARVA site plan. Um, Adam has been our rep for this project, so if he's able to join us, I will be asking him to write the letter for this project. Um, uh, so yes, let's go ahead and get started. Um, who do we have on the line for the ARVA site plan? Uh, Matt Roberts with uh, Herschler, uh, as well as a few other folks. Wasn't sure if uh, you all were going to handle public comment first. I thought yes. I that earlier. Oh my God, uh, I forgot. Thank we're you very here. much, Matt. Looking forward to speak to you uh, when you guys are ready. Thank you very much. All right, so yes, let's go ahead and do that. So Dr. Byrne, you can go ahead and turn on your camera and microphone and um, I will pass it to you, Marka. Actually, it All might right. be better if I talk after this presentation because that way you will serve that first. If it's OK, Bernie, we want to actually have you go first. That way we can go straight into the commissioner conversation. Um, so yeah, if you could go, that would be great. Thank you. All right, Dr. Byrne. Yes, this is about the Arbor site plan. Um, the northeast corner of this site will contain a public open space into a future park near the intersection of Persian Drive and North Wayne Street. However, landscape sheets in the project's 4.1 submission do not identify the species locate do identify the species location of trees, but do not identify any trees, ground cover, or plants the park may contain. So we don't know what's going to go into this park, uh, and that's important. Uh, most landscape architects don't supply this; it makes a big problem. Some do. Uh, the applicant needs to submit landscape sheets to identify these plants. Uh, the public will need this information when discussing the landscape plan at the public hearings. The planning commission and the county board will hold this plan. You will, you may also need these uh, when you if you review the final park plan. The park will feature a large central lawn. This mold area will not be biophilic and will support fruit pollinators. Lawns are inconsistent with the uh, county board's 2016 monarch pledge, which recommends planting of milkweed and other plants that support pollinators. Monarch butterflies, including those. The park perimeter will contain small plant beds, some which will be, will be raised. That, however, trees will mostly shade these. As a result, these will support few pollinators. Uh, the applicant should make the park primarily biophilic and filled mostly with native pollinated plants rather than with a mold lawn. Uh, this is really important. This is the kind of park that, that the county board, or the county planners often make. And really is not helping the pollinator problem at all. Um, this is, um, the, the, the park should be most, um, the, the, the applicant should select the parks for the plants for the park because generally the, uh, the, 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 the county uh, park people do not select common milkweed. Uh, few, few of the counties do in renovated county parks contain many plants that support pollinators. Most contain mold lawns, much landscape, and many, much hardscape, and many planting of ornamental grasses. None contain uh, common milkweed, uh, which best support monarch populations. The only milkweed that really does, uh, and that survives well. Grasses are wind pollinated and fill feed fewer pollinators into those that inter insects pollinate. The park and other open spaces on the site, including the tree trenches, the roof, and the landscape architect being the Arlington Bike Trail, Boulevard Bike Trail, and the building should contain much common milkweed and other native plants that support pollinators. If implemented, the, the applicant's present plans will not even come close to achieving this. You really need to discuss this. And, to, and if you really want to see biophilia, and if you really want to see um, native butterflies and birds and things like that, this type of plant should not be approved, uh, especially for the parks. Uh, and the roof, by the way, doesn't contain is, is, is doesn't contain a, um, a green roof. Thank you, uh, Dr. Byrne. The time has expired. It. Right. Thank you, Dr. Byrne, for your comments. Much appreciated. All right, and so now I will pass it back yet again to um, the uh, team on the phone for us. Well, great. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, Ashton, are you able to share your screen with our presentation? I'm about to give it a try, so it's looking Great. promising. Well, while we're getting ready, uh, I know we uh, want to be respectful of time, so good evening. Uh, I'm Matt Roberts with uh, Herschler, 
here tonight on behalf of the applicant and team. Uh, with me tonight are Ashton Allen of uh, Studios Architecture, Sarah Whitley of Land Design, uh, and Nan Patel with, uh, with the uh, project ownership. Uh, very excited to be discussing this project with you. This is a long time coming, and so uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to getting this across the finish line. Uh, just to orient everyone to the site, you've probably passed this site many times before. Uh, this is uh, the Days Inn site located at the North Pershing Drive and Arlington Boulevard intersection. It's in Lyon Park, uh, immediately adjacent to uh, the Arlington Boulevard Trail, the Washington Lee Apartments on our south, as well as 2201 uh, North Pershing Park uh, part Apartments uh, directly across the street from us. Really, we're in what the county has long considered sort of the south side of the gateway into Lyon Park. I'm looking forward to completing that uh, with our application. Next slide, please. So the site today is currently developed with a 128-unit motel uh, under a Days Inn franchise presently, uh, but it was first developed in 1955 uh, and known then as the Arva Motel. Uh, it's had various iterations over the years uh, with various franchises, and that's really played into the site history, but really the thing that uh, we know it for, and, and the uh, county knows it for, is as the uh, historic Arva Motel. So we're going to look to uh, honor some of that in the redesign of the building. Next slide, please. In uh, the, the site really came to fruition in uh, 2021 with the approval of a special glove study uh, that the board approved for the, pro uh, for the site, uh, really focusing on mixed-use uh, redevelopment of the site uh, that completes that gateway, like I mentioned. Uh, guidance for us about what we wanted to achieve with the site included uh, on-site open space, something that we're going to talk a lot about tonight, uh, but also height and density and how that relates to the adjacent neighborhood and how we create uh, the gateway to the neighborhood through those mechanisms. Uh, and then, like I said, also the site history, embracing that on how we integrate it uh, into our overall design. Next slide, please. We're very pleased with the application and how it's turning out and especially how it tracks the study. Uh, what we're presently looking at is a mixed-use redevelopment of the site, residential and retail, uh, 251 apartment units, uh, as well as roughly 3,000 square feet uh, of retail on site, uh, as well as various parks, open space, and connections between the neighborhood uh, and the ultimate trail that we'll talk quite a bit about this evening. Uh, next slide, please. And so in order to achieve what we uh, have set out to do, we're using a number of different mechanisms uh, to get there, uh, primarily through community benefits, and there are quite a few of them. Uh, there is going to be on-site affordable dwelling units as part of a GLUP contribution. There will be a LEED Gold certific uh, certification with the site uh, and achieving that uh, with the redevelopment. Uh, Off-site protected bike lanes, but importantly for this group, very, very significant open space contributions, which, we're, uh, which we'll get into. Um, importantly, we'll be redeveloping what is presently today VDOT right-of-way and pavement uh, along the sort of eastern edge of the site to continue the trail connection south uh, from Arlington Boulevard across North Pershing Drive and really formalize that uh, and make it, you know, something beautiful and something uh, that, you know, the project can be proud of. Uh, the other really significant uh, open space benefit is going to be an on-site park, approximately 10,000 square feet, in fact, a little bit over that. Uh, so exceeding uh, the GLUP expectation. Uh, and to the comment that was made, you know, uh, really what we're doing as part of our community benefits package is going to be leading uh, a design and build process with the community after approval of this project uh, that's going to ultimately get at what should go in there. Uh, the GLUP study looked at that part of the site and really said uh, it should be passive uh, and, you know, kind of gave us some general guidelines. But We've to date really just used illustrative drawings in that area because really uh, the community is going to have its input uh, uh, after the site is approved. Uh, and that's when we'll really get into the nuts and bolts of what should go in there, uh, both in terms of landscaping, uh, you know, recreational activity, and, and, and the like. So it is coming. Uh, we've kind of left that open to interpretation for today, uh, but it is our ultimate commitment to design and, and build that as part of our project. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ashton to walk you through some of the architecture and then over to Sarah to talk about some of those uh, open space benefits. Great. Thank you, Matt. I'm Ashton Allen with Studios Architecture, and I'm going to walk you around the architecture of the building quickly and its relationship to the open spaces that Matt was just talking about. This is a view where we're floating above the intersection of Arlington Boulevard and Pershing Drive. Pershing Drive is off here to the right. 
and you see some of these historic uh, kind of artifacts built into the architecture and carried forward in kind of a mix between mid-century modern, modern, and, uh, and a contemporary architecture. Um, but really all of these are serving great uh, as a great backdrop to great public spaces. Over here to the right or the left, you see the, the, the public use trail, a new kind of larger open space at the corner. And then uh, over here at the right, this is the um, uh, retail, re retail equivalent space with a lobby at the center. Zooming into the corner, you see the Arva sign uh, kind of re reimagined from what it had originally been, a far cry from the Days End sign that it is today, but same similar shape, as well as some of the historic uh, marking opportunities that we've identified. These are not yet designed uh, at, at the foreground of the site. Continuing along, uh, this is looking across Pershing Drive. Um, you can see the retail equivalent space down here at the at the right, the lobby to the left, and then the uh, private vehicular access that's moving through the site, really removing, as uh, it was in that summary, about five curb cuts from the site and focusing all the vehicular circulation on one curb cut here at Pershing Drive and another curb cut that we'll show you a little bit at the, at the Muse along Wayne Street. As we go further down Pershing Drive, you can see there's a little key up here in the corner. We're now looking across the uh, the yet to be designed uh, park in the public access easement that, Mark, uh, uh, that Matt shared around 10,000 square feet. The architecture supports around it with uh, the corner of the, the retail or retail equivalent space and bike parking and, and units to the back that are all accessed from space that's not a part of that public access easement. Flipping around, we're now hovering above Wayne Street, looking up uh, the Muse, which was something that was articulated in the GLUP study, uh, as is as was the park itself, as a way to for uh, mixed mode transit, slow cars that are only accessing the site, uh, pedestrians and bicycles that not only access or provide all the vehicular access for the site along with the curb cut on Pershing, but also a pedestrian and bicycle access and mixed mode access to the trail underneath the building. As you can see, you know, uh, there also, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Byrne had mentioned, uh, you know, concern about green roofs. There's extensive landscaping that is up on the private amenity deck and up on, on the roof terraces, but uh, but something that's not necessarily subject to the 4.1, so we're not looking to, to have commentary on that. Another piece uh, that is worth discussion is that there is an area, a private area for, uh, for pets that is uh, not continuous with the park. It is separated by parks and, and ways, but it does provide additional relief at that Wayne Street edge, kind of maintaining a, a certain uh, certain presence and, uh, and, and green landscape opportunity. Flipping around, now we are on the opposite side of Arlington Boulevard, looking back at the, at the property, and you can see the kind of edge of the mixed use trail. The Arva sign as it pops up in the distance, and then this the fanning architecture that is kind of capturing that geometry coming back. Zooming closer into this trail, you can see the the kind of portal as we pass through under the Muse to the back down to Wayne Street, giving a shortcut across the site, but also this improved public use trail and uh, you know some ideas about the 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 landscape and improvements for what is now uh, essentially a paved access road adjacent to a parking lot, completely transforming that entire frontage into um, uh, a lush landscaped uh, amenity. And to talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah from Land Design. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Whiteley. I'm with Land Design, the landscape architects on this project. Uh, we're going to start by looking a little bit more at the GLUP study um, that was previously done. Uh, and so you'll notice in the northeastern portion of the site, the, the GLUP study proposes increased activation through circulation pathways, uh, as well as some green spaces at that corner, which improve upon the existing Wainwright portion, connecting the trail up to the corner of the site. Uh, moving west along North Pershing Drive, the GLUP study proposes some pedestrian-oriented sidewalk frontages, which feature some improved streetscape elements, such as increased canopy, as well as some bike facilities. It also limits the vehicular access that's on this portion of the site. Um, and that is shown at number four there, yep, in the middle. 
Uh, and then on the northwestern portion of the plan, it proposes a large open space consisting of trees, uh, green space, as well as some plaza space uh, in that portion. Uh, and then next slide. So this is also from the GLUB study. Uh, we're looking northwest in the direction um, towards uh, Arlington Boulevard at the, the far end there. Um, and so as you can see, the GLUB has two tree-lined uh, streets, North Pershing and North Wayne Street here, uh, as well as having that park space. It's kind of ill-defined, but we know it's that large portion of the corner there with some plaza space as well. Uh, and then next slide. If you can hit the next slide, Ash, Jim. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so keeping a line in, in mind what Matt had mentioned earlier in the presentation, that this park will be fully designed with the community input um, further in the process. So the specific elements of the park you know, will be further ironed out as we get as we get in that process. Um, but as the GLUB study shows, it has that large park portion at this corner of the site. And so what we have initially proposed is something very similar. Um, but the key elements we'd like to discuss are, are the biophilic elements that we, we see being incorporated in this park uh, with the community input. Um, and so anyone unfamiliar with the biophilic idea, biophilia is the tendency for humans to interact um, and be closely associated with nature. Uh, and so these are the elements we'd like to see infused in that final design. And so that can be achieved in a number of ways, uh, a few of those being a native plant palette, naturally sourced materials uh, that bring people in contact with the texture and the natural ground plane. Uh, it can also be achieved in more subtle ways, such as the design of the park through the forms, the shapes, the vertical pieces that people interact with as, as they're in the park. Um, and those elements and shapes, they can remind people of, of natural features, such as a honeycomb. Um, and the vertical tree and canopy elements can be more reminiscent of a shady meadow and, and more natural settings um, so that we can infuse that in our urban park here. Uh, and so one of the elements that ties all this together uh, is, that, is that first bullet point there, the human relationship to nature. So through all these different elements that we have in the park, we really are creating this sensory experience through sight, through smell, sound, you know, with these different planting materials, the textures of the paving, you have this immersive experience that is brought into an urban setting. Um, and then Ashton, next slide, please. And moving back east on the uh, side of the plant along Arlington Boulevard, uh, this is another snip from the GLUB study um, that really highlights that trail system as having this great double row of trees, planted areas below it uh, with ample vegetation, uh, as you experience this trail system and then get further closer to the building. We still have this, this idea of, of amenity lush plantings. And then next slide. And so that top right corner is another image of the club study. We're looking at that Arlington Boulevard corner, North Pershing Drive. Um, you can see that the double row of trees goes the full way. And then on the left side of the screen, this is this is the corner of our proposed plan. Uh, where we have this double row of trees, the full length, green spaces throughout, all the way up to this northern corner here. Um, and so within that corner, we have these different planted areas that will be native planting, you know, from ground covers all the way up to the trees that are shown here. And within that space, there's incorporated seating elements for pedestrians to pause. Um, and there's some bioretention along the, along the building frontage. And so another big component that we're incorporating in this is the uh, micromobility station. And so those are the images that you see on that on that right side. Those are potential options of how we're enhancing uh, the connectivity of this. Uh, and so by having one of these elements or multiple of these elements, you know, we're surrounding, uh, we're connecting the surrounding network of, of mobility to our site and to the other sites. And so it really becomes a trail system, but also a pause point for those who are needing a bike tune up or, you know, grabbing a bike. Um, and so with that, it, it fully connects to the other portions of the site while, in, while creating some naturalistic elements as well. So it's a little blend of urban environment with a naturalistic planting palette. Yeah. And with that, I think, you know, the big message here is the, you know, redevelopment of ARVA is the opportunity to transform a really paving focused, almost parking lot development into a, a nature rich uh, 
development that has uh, you know architecture that's serving providing great housing and, uh, and and great parks for the community. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, look forward to any questions. Thank you very much to your team for presenting. This has been great. Um, I will kick us off and please commissioners um, raise your hand. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm going to ask for Adam to, to draft this letter. He's not on right now, as far as I can tell. So I'm also looking for volunteers on editing as well. Um, so I'll kick it off. Firstly, I want to say I can really imagine this building in its location. I think that's a testament to your designs um, and also like our familiarity with this site and just how important it is to get it right because of its really front facing location um, in an already existing um, community that gets a lot of traffic, right? Um, so yes, I, I really don't have any major criticisms on the park design. I'm really excited about um, that public-private partnership there. I'm also really um, excited about your commitment to both finding ways to accommodate the dog population, um, the dog walker population separately from the outdoor space, as well as I think more holistically thinking about um, contributing to the streetscape of a kind of neglected area where we know the appeal of living in this neighborhood and specifically in this property is because of its proximity to walkable locations in that corridor that, you know, if you make it um, feel biophilically safe, then you will go and actually walk it more often. So I really do appreciate that. I want to just mention um, to kick us off on criticisms, um, Dr. Burns' comment, we've seen a lot of success in being able to include rooftops in site plan um, conversations. And I think it would just be nice the community for the community to get specifics about what that rooftop contribution in terms of green plantings that, can, that are going to even be on the amenity floors potentially may look like, it, it'll instill some confidence that that same design principles are being carried through to those maybe um, secondary tertiary elements. Um, and, and then back to my main point that we have seen in the recent past that um, being able to contribute heavily within the rooftop elements really um, is where we can make some of our gains that otherwise kind of get thrown away. So that's that's what I have to say just in terms of comments. I'm going to pass it to Colt to start with. Colt, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I've lived in Arlington a long time and familiar with that with that corner and this looks like uh, an incredible design for for that neighborhood. But keeping in with with our our uh, parks our parks flavor, is this a privately owned public space or is it a park? Sure. So it's going to be under a public access easement. I think yeah, the so, nomenclature yeah. really lends itself towards park. Uh, you know, it's being analyzed by the right. county in that in that view and in right. that light. Uh, so it'll be privately maintained. It'll right. be you know our responsibility long right. term. Uh, but we've tried to deal with the uh, design build aspect of it so that you know it's not just money going to the county to eventually build right. a park. Uh, it'll be done in conjunction uh, or as close in conjunction to designing and building the building. And so those two things can really yeah. coexist in that process yeah. uh, for the future park and coexist with this. Thank you. I was just curious about what, what its status is, was going to be. Uh, when we're looking at that new space and it's 10,000 plus square feet, in Arlington, you know, we're trying to fight for every square foot of green space that we can get. What's how much of that 10,000 square feet is impermeable surface and how much of it is park space? I mean, from our green space, from looking at it, I mean, it looks more like the parking lot surrounded by with a swimming pool in the middle. I mean, if, if you look at it like that. So, you know, I, and, and I don't know what the actual ratio is, but it looks a little heavy on the impermeable surface side. But I, I just thought I'd ask if you had a ratio for that or had some stats on it. Well, I don't know that we do just yet. I think part of that lends itself to the fact that, you know, the county has strongly encouraged us to give some illustrative design, but really right. not to nope. think too deep about those details yet. Uh, okay. So that's sort of TBD. One item I will tell you, though, and it's something specific that, you know, we thought long and hard about, 
uh, was how to utilize that space in relationship to the building and candidly the underground garage. Yeah. Um, so one thing that we've designed very specifically is keeping the garage completely out from under uh, that area of the park. Uh, and so the garage is entirely contained within the area of the building uh, to the east of where the park's going to be. And that park is basically going to be what I would consider free and clear from uh, from the surface to the bottom. So that is going to help establish, you know, plants and trees and all the other things. We, we were very mindful of that. OK, no, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing more of it. Good questions, Cole. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Melissa, you're up. Um, I, my points have kind of already been made, but I will keep saying them anyway. Um, I really like the design. I've seen of this so far. Um, and I, I want to jump a little bit on what Trudy had said about the rooftop space being utilized. Um, I know we won't have a plant list for a while. Not, and those usually come later. But I, I just was curious if um, when we would, like, uh, if they would be matching the ones below or if there'd be more diversity of the other plants that you're planting in um, the park nearby. So I was just curious to see if like there'd be cohesion between them or be a lot more diversity. That'd be nice to know eventually. Um, I also like the connection to the trail. I, you had mentioned no ah, mobility stations. Is there a capital bike share already near there or would that be something to be considered? Yes, yeah, certainly, you know, what we'll ultimately be looking at is some type of fixed station combined with scooter station, uh, capital bike share, something that's more on site or immediately adjacent to the site in that VDOT right of way. Uh, we've talked a lot with VDOT about what can go on there and they're fairly open uh, to the ideas that we've shown them. Um, I think in terms of questions about green roof plantings and things like that, I would turn that to Ashton or Sarah. I would say though, there might be an issue of nomenclature uh, where we say green roof as sort of a stormwater connected facility uh, you know, and, and really what we can count or not count towards our stormwater calculations as being within, you know, kind of a, an industry label green roof, but that isn't to say there aren't plantings and other things that you might consider kind of uh, colloquially a green roof. And so that, mm -hmm. that may be one of the distinctions that people are getting caught up in. Uh, as Ashton mentioned earlier, there's a lot of plantings, there are things up there. It's just not all of it is connected to a stormwater system and therefore not, you know, not called out as like industry labeled green roof. So Sarah or Ashton, I don't know if you want to speak to that briefly. Sure, sure. I can add on to that. So what Matt said is completely correct. Green roof in the in our industry typically relates directly to the stormwater system. And so that's that's not necessarily the nomenclature we use, but there are plants up there. Uh, in terms of your first question about the diversity between the levels between rooftop and the and the site, um, we tend to do a, a mixture to have a blend of sites, site plantings. So there is a flavor, there is a cohesion between the site and the different levels. Um, that being said, the rooftop is much sunnier. And so the plants are a little bit more dictated by the sunlight and the, the microclimate that is created being on a high level rooftop. Mm. Great, thank you. And, and on the capital bike share question, there's a capital bike station on the northwest corner of Pershing and um, and Wayne. So it's basically mm -hmm. kitty corner from the park already. Mm, awesome. Great. Thank you so much. I think I see Sarah's hand up. Sorry, I was on mute. Go for it, Sarah. Oh, now you are on mute, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry, I hit the camera button and not the microphone button. Um, uh, I just wanted to say, as far as the park design build being part of the community benefits package, I think this is a really great thing for the community to kind of minimize the construction impacts. I think we're starting to see this in a couple other projects in other parts of the county as well. And I just wanna you know, voice general support for that generally as, a, as an idea and commend you all for taking that on. Um, I did have a question, since there is a public easement, is this going to be a traditional public park planning process for the design piece or will that be developer led? It'll be developer led, uh, but ultimately going through a very similar process to you, you would do if it was uh, DPR led. So the conditions are gonna work that out in terms of the number of meetings, you know, when those things need to start. 
uh, but the process is going to largely track the DPR process. So our team, or lots of parts of our team have gone through this before with other projects in the county, like West Roslyn, the Highlands, things such as that. So very familiar uh, with uh, you know, the county's processes and ultimately looking to integrate a lot of that into what we'll, we'll do for this park. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the question, Sarah. Marco, would it be possible for us to also understand um, possibly uh, through over email what staff involvement is going to look like on that project? Um, just so we can get some flavor if there's been any conversation about that at this stage. And or do you see, guys know too? Yeah, I actually see Walter on the line. I think he may have an answer to that. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Hey, I'm Walter Gonzalez. I'm a planner, uh, park development division. I'm a planner following this uh, project and various other site plans. So for this one, as uh, Matt had mentioned, it's going to be developer led, but we'll still with DPR process and it'll follow like a similar other park planning process with um, community meetings, two or three, depending. We're still hashing those out specifically in the site plan condition language, but it'll follow some more process like that. Whereas we would ask them to develop a concept present those concepts, get input from the community, refine those concepts, then f come up with one final concept to present, go through PRC, and then uh, the commissions, whatever else we have to go through, any other commission we'd have to go through, but it would follow some similar process like that, like we have done before uh, through our park master planning. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you already mentioned it, but I would request that PRC have a seat at that table. <laughs> I think that we would ask for Adam to be that representative likely um but yeah okay that sounds good we'd love to stay involved in that so thank you for that clarification um all right alex if you want to go ahead hi could you all describe what you anticipate having up on the roof right now uh since uh, the commission is really interested in that uh what sort of yeah you know, what sort of infrastructure do you have up there i noticed a notation for some sort of eco roof uh, when you were flipping through the deck could you talk a little bit about all that sarah i'll i'll kind of mention the two spaces and program but if you want to kind of go into the the, the landscape acts aspects of it i think that would be great so there are two primary i'll call it occupied roof spaces on the project one is at that i'll call it the lower leg that stretched out toward wayne street and on there is uh is is the pool as well as uh, certain landscape terrace elements that are connected with a fitness fitness uh, area for the for the gym itself, and within those, there's certain there there's kind of pretty intensive landscape uh, creating that environment. Then on the I'll call it the corner of Pershing and uh, and Arlington Boulevard at the high roof, there is a, a larger overlook at a, more of a community room. And that I think is what is what is labeled the, the the kind of landscape element again, where this is creating, you know, an environment for residents to to gather uh, that's not noisy at the pool. I know that that was something that Lion Park is very interested in. So it's a different place that's more of a party room that's a that's kind of away from the neighborhood, and frankly has an incredible view over the um, uh, over the Monument Corridor of Washington D.C. over Fort Myer, and uh, and and so that those are the kind of two program spaces and 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 elegant landscaping to support that. And Sarah, I'll kind of toss it to you to talk a little bit about those landscape pieces. Sure. Yes. Thank you. So the the lower roof that that has the pool fitness area, um, this kind of conjunction. Um, there's planting throughout. We kind of have uh, buffer planting between the pool space to have a little bit more of a designation between the fitness area and the indoor-outdoor um, correlation. Uh, and so with that, we have tiered planting uh, between ground covers, uh, ornamental grasses, um, perennials, shrubs, um, up to small uh, ornamental trees where it can be supported. Um, and so that defines the space a little bit but in that fitness area to pool area. Uh, and then moving up to the upper roof, um, as Ashton said, it's a little bit more of a gathering space, uh, grill, chill kind of space. Uh, and so with that, we have planting at the perimeter. Uh, we've got different elements uh, in the in the interior of the space that supports some seating, um, backed with planting, and again, some smaller ornamental trees where possible. Um, but as I mentioned before, each of these have a different microclimate, and so that's that's always the highest importance for us is ensuring that the plants that are that are specified will actually work and survive um, and not die out and can you know weather this weather the time of being in the the high roof under the, such 
uh, extreme heat uh, and sometimes rain conditions. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for those answers as well. Um, anyone else have any final questions on the ARVA project? All right. Well, thank you guys very much. We look forward to continuing to work with you guys um, and hearing from you on future steps of this project. Um, we will be writing to the board um, ahead of the meeting on the 15th um, uh, in approval of the project with our um, continued requests for a biophilic approach and a naturalistic way of bringing um, more greenery to our community. So thank you very much. Thank you for having us and we're looking forward to your support. Thank you. All right. And so moving on, thank you guys. Um, we have Ryan Delaney on with us to talk about the forestry and natural resources plan. Um, as a reminder, this is going to be still worked on um, throughout the rest of the summer. And Ryan will talk a little bit about timeline, which to me is most important here, as well as some of the major changes. Um, but I think the other big thing is that we want to get our opinions on this draft in quickly so that they can be incorporated as quickly as possible as well, um, if needed. Um, and so we're thinking about, you know, pushing the bounty a little bit on what we want on this first report. Um, and so Ryan, thank you yet again for being here with us. We all know and love you now, cheerleaders for Ryan. Um, and yeah, think about your questions since we will be writing a letter on this as well. Jill has already started to work on one and Jill will talk about that in the other business section. Um, so Ryan, to you. All right, great. Let me pull up the slides and we'll get started. I'll try to condense as much as possible um, in light of time so you all have uh, you know, plenty of time for discussion and questions. But um, yeah, let me know if you all can see those now. They've just popped up for me. Yes, we can. Great. Thanks, Marco. Um, all right. So good evening. My name is Ryan Delaney. I'm a planner with DPR and I'm the project manager for the Forestry and Natural Resources Plan Update. Uh, thanks for making room on the busy agenda this evening to hear from us. Um, and as you know, we recently published the latest draft of the plan for public comment and wanted to take this opportunity, as Shruti said, to provide a, a bit of a reorientation to the project, offer a short summary of um, public feedback on our last round of engagement and the changes we made in response to that, and an overview of our timeline moving forward. Um, so we just published, um, or sorry, let me back up uh, quickly. As a recap, um, as you all know, we published the preliminary draft of the FNRP last summer. We spent the last few months analyzing that feedback, incorporating it into the draft, and creating the next iteration of the FNRP. Uh, that is the version that we just published on June 1st, and our engagement process is in full swing. Um, we're really excited to hear what folks have to say about the new draft. Uh, that puts us in the information gathering and briefings phase shown on the right side of this graphic, indicated by the orange arrow. Um, and looking forward, we're targeting a request to advertise this fall and ultimately to bring um, the draft to the board this winter, ideally in December. Before we move on, I want to touch base really briefly on uh, the highlights of our last engagement since that informed the draft that um, is out there for review right now. Um, first to say we had really broad participation across our various mechanisms, ultimately totaling over 4,000 responses across all of our engagement methods, which we were really pleased about. Um, and in terms of what we heard, at a high level, most folks were pleased with the draft. Uh, they felt that the actions under each strategic direction as a whole supported the vision um, that Arlington had articulated for uh, its forests and natural resources, and that the vision in the plan was a good one. Now that said, this shouldn't be a surprise to any of you all. We received a lot of constructive feedback that fell uh, kind of roughly into the theme shown on this slide, um, including wanting to see more urgency in tone and content, especially related to climate um, and some of the action verbs throughout the plan, um, a desire to see equity become more core to all elements of the plan, um, for the next round of the draft to include measurable goals, metrics, and implementation um, recommendations, to see deeper, more creative thinking about land uses and possible incentives, um, educational efforts, 
And then um, we received some feedback around uh, wanting to see a more ambitious goal for tree canopy than just sort of a blanket statement of 40% countywide tree canopy. Moving into the new draft, um, since our last engagement in response to all of that feedback, we've made a lot of changes to the document across kind of these, these main three areas here. We enhanced the introduction by adding a new executive summary and making edits to reflect uh, the comments on urgency and tone that I just mentioned. Um, we made changes to some of our existing recommendations and introduced new ones in the strategic directions, which I'll go over in a little bit um, more detail later in the slides. Um, and then lastly, in terms of structure and format, this version of the draft, is, as you all probably have noticed if you've, if you've even looked at the cover page, um, incorporates maps, graphics, and charts. Um, we have strengthened our action verbs and cross-references throughout the recommendations, um, expanded the appendices, and most importantly, developed um, an implementation plan and draft priority actions, uh, which we'll close our discussion with today. So with that, I'd like to move into a really quick refresher on what's in the plan for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at it since last summer. Um, this slide here shows the high level outline, um, noting our new executive summary and our implementation plan. And this one highlights our strategic directions. And those are the, the broad policy areas that create a framework for the plan's guidance. Um, and the structure and general intent of these has not changed since the preliminary draft, but they've all seen several refinements since the last time you've seen them. So uh, now that we're all oriented, I'm going to go through the changes we made in response to um, our last round of public feedback, chapter by chapter, starting with um, SD1 conservation. So as I mentioned, um, we received some comments indicating that our 40% canopy goal was not comprehensive um, or ambitious enough. And while we disagree on the, the qualitative side and our analysis indicates that uh, the limitations on plantable space mean as a high level goal, 40% is reasonable. We added specificity, calling out local conditions and ecology, uh, historical inequity, and created a closer cross-reference to our tree uh, equity goals and included a call out uh, for uh, MW COG's work, continued work on regional tree canopy targets as a potential planning input. Um, and then additionally, we included these new action steps 1.1.2 and 1.1.3 here on the slide to further refine that goal. In prior versions of the document, we didn't have a corresponding goal for forest health or ecological function, which is why we've included the native tree canopy recommendation. And we didn't have strong guidance for public sites, um, uh, the tree canopy targets for public sites and how they could contribute to the uh, overall county tree canopy goal, sort of a leading by example recommendation. Um, 1.2.4 and 1.2.5 were included to add specificity to uh, the commitment that we make throughout SD1 uh, to create more space for trees and natural resources. And lastly, 1.2.6 was added in response to the ongoing conversation um, with the board and the public about updating the weed ordinance, the, the, the Arlington County Code, to facilitate and encourage um, more native plantings on private property. There's some other smaller changes that um, we made the, to SD1, including updates to existing recommendations to seek out even small land opportunities, uh, land acquisition opportunities for natural resources. Uh, for example, some of the recent DES micro reforestation projects would fall into that category. Um, and to pursue bringing forested APS lands into county management um, or collaborative management for consistent forest management policies across the county. Um, the other new element in SD1 is our uh, guide to biophilic design. This section is really similar to the casual use space guidance in the PSMP. Uh, we heard a lot of feedback, particularly from commission members, that um, guidance on what is and isn't biophilic design would be really helpful for SPRCs, for example, and other project reviews. So we developed this supplement uh, for SD1 where most of our development related recommendations live. It doesn't really constitute a formal design checklist or manual, but we felt that um, the FNRP could help better illustrate what the county means by biophilic design by sharing successful projects from uh, private development, school sites, parks, and streetscapes. And it's essentially meant to reinforce the recommendations we have throughout the document, but kind of pull them all into one visually compelling place that makes it an easy reference. Moving to SD2. Um, the major change here was with action step 2.1.1, 1. 1, 
which was refined and enhanced with preliminary GIS analysis, identifying several neighborhoods that are currently underserved by trees and green infrastructure, and connecting this back a little bit more strongly to the existing, existing conditions description in the introduction to the document. We also explicitly um, placed this recommendation as a prioritization measure for the overall 40% tree canopy goal and cross-referenced it um, more heavily with strategic direction four, um, directing staff essentially to report out on progress to our tree equity goals. Um, moving forward, the major update to SD3 uh, is the addition of this recommendation here regarding the use of native plants. Uh, as you all probably know, uh, DPR currently follows a native plants preferred policy for public sites. And this recommendation really uh, recommends that the county should move towards a native plant requirement that expands the use and retention of local and regional native plants. And we developed this in close coordination with um, our colleagues over at CPHD and staff across DPR. And it's accompanied by a new appendix laying out um, a draft native plant standard. That document includes um, lists of definitions and requirements, and it's intended to be sort of a kickstart for implementation of this recommendation. We've listed this as a short term action item in our implementation plan, and it's one of the draft priority actions. So I wanted to highlight it this evening. And then uh, lastly, uh, strategic direction for operations was streamlined a bit, but remains essentially the same as the preliminary draft. The only major change I really wanted to um, touch on briefly was refocusing um, action 4.1.4, which previously was a narrow recommendation, uh, essentially directing part, uh, DPR staff to report out uh, to the county board on the number of trees in the county that were tracking through the permit process. It's been broadened to incorporate progress reporting on the tree equity goals in SD2 and other metrics that we've described throughout SD4 to be a little bit more comprehensive. And then I mentioned earlier that this iteration of the draft includes our implementation plan. Um, so each recommendation in the plan, that's the three digit um, recommendations, is included in, in this table um, in the implementation plan, along with some high level details about proposed timing, responsible parties, potential partners, planning level cost estimates, and potential funding sources. It'll look familiar to you if you're um, familiar with the PSNP, because we're essentially using the same format and scales for time frame and cost estimates to kind of keep things consistent. And that leads us into the last portion of new material, um, the priority actions. This initial selection of 10 priority actions was compiled by our project team and selected to emphasize the major changes that the FNRP recommends um, in contrast to current practice, to highlight our equity recommendations, elevate actions staff felt would be most impactful, reflect what, and, and really to reflect what we learned about community priorities through our last engagement. In the interest of preserving some of your all's discussion time, I'll spare you, um, you know, me reading through the list, um, but want to pause here quickly to uh, give you all a chance to read through the first five before I move to the next uh, slide with our, our final five. And I can come back to this at any point uh, if needed during the conversation. OK. Um, and then moving on to our our last five here. We're particularly interested in folks feedback on these priority actions as we move through our engagement process. Um, we have a separate section of the engagement form that deals with the implementation matrix um, that includes uh, you know, these actions and really interested particularly um, in the commission's feedback on our, our priority actions as you all review. But please, um, you know, as you share the plan with your networks and discuss it, um, feel free to flag these as a, a point of interest for, for staff. We'd really like to hear what folks think. And then with that, I'd like to transition to our engagement and next steps before I hand it back to you all. Um, so this time around, we have a 30 day engagement period, which will close on June 30th. It includes an online comment form, which is currently open, an in-person open house, which we hosted last week at Lubber Run, uh, which was essentially to offer a less formal setting to interact with the project team, discuss questions and comments on the draft. I think anecdotally we had a uh, good turnout and great conversation with our attendees, but we haven't yet analyzed all the written comments. So I'm going to hold off on diving into that 
um, until we do our engagement recap. But I think it was a really good start to our engagement period. And then additionally, either for folks who couldn't make that event or are more comfortable in a virtual setting, we're going to be hosting two virtual office hours, um, which are essentially drop in opportunities for folks to um, engage with the project team or um, you know, to to grill me specifically, I guess uh, those are coming up on the 26th and the 28th. Uh, the the time uh, blocks that will be available are on the project website. And then finally, we'll be visiting all of our commissions like we did last year, uh, including Energag, C2E2 and FNRC, as well as you all this evening. And then kind of to wrap things up, um, as I said, we're in the midst of our engagement on the draft. So our immediate next steps are to keep rolling and make, making sure that we reach the broadest uh, amount of folks possible. We'll then spend the rest of the summer, as Shruti mentioned, making edits and updating uh, the draft to incorporate the feedback we receive. And as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, we're ultimately aiming to bring this before the board this winter um, with the sort of intermediate step of a request to advertise this fall. So uh, hopefully I didn't move too fast, but hopefully I, I clawed back some time for your all's discussion. That brings me to the end of the slides for this evening um, and happy to yield it back to you all for discussion questions um, and happy to stay for whatever you need me for. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you as always um, for the overview. So um, I just want to mention that like the deadline that I'm self-imposing for July 1st is really based on the end of that open engage public engagement period ending. Um, I know E2C2 will be submitting their letter in mid-July, which is totally fine, um, but I'll leave it for our future discussion um, at the end of this meeting to get into the specifics, but I think we're ready to be able to do that by the end of the month. So let's still try and aim for that. As you saw, there are a lot of really great positives, improvements made in this draft. Um, I've already had my turn at commenting on it um, to Ryan directly. And so I'd love to hear if anyone had any questions. Um, we will talk about the main points of our potential letter later um, in today's call. Um, so these are just questions for Ryan about the newest draft, about next steps, you know, all that jazz. And I see Colt, please go ahead and get us started. Ryan, thank you very much. I got to uh, attend the, the event at Lover Run and hang up our sticky notes and had some great conversations uh, with staff and with the people that were there. So I strongly encourage people to use those drop-in hours if they haven't had a chance chance if they've got questions. It was a very welcoming uh, experience. Uh, and thank you very much for making the changes that, that we were initially concerned with and have incorporated so much uh, uh, new ideas and, and thinking. I particularly like uh, the, I particularly like the notion of um, finding little nooks and crannies in Arlington that are rights of way and parts of schools and bits and pieces of smaller properties that we could use to plant native plants that we currently don't. And I, I know that in many neighborhoods, citizens are saying, boy, I'd sure like to do something with that corner. And now they can. So, so I think there's a lot uh, of very positive things. I have a, a I just have a, a question for me that's just curious. It's like uh, when they were talking about the dark skies initiative, and, and some of those things were applicable to special exemption projects. And I didn't know what that was, what, what does that mean? I mean, dark sky sounds like a, a great opportunity for Arlington businesses, public and private to get involved in, but I, I didn't know, I didn't understand the, the special exemption project limitation. Sure, um, it, it's uh, probably more mundane than it, than it sounds. It, it, it refers just to um, site plans and special use permits. So places where uh, in the review of the project, we have a little bit more uh, as the county government authority to either approve or or deny or work with our, our development partners. Um, and that's really in light of the fact that, um, you know, for existing private properties, for example, we have very little sort of regulatory authority to require changes like this. Obviously, that doesn't prevent us from, you know, extolling the virtues of dark sky okay. friendly lighting yeah. and, and doing education and outreach. 
but uh, that that's more of a targeted recommendation to bring those five principles that the um, International Dark Sky Association uh, sort of puts out there and promulgates as um, you know res environmentally responsible lighting to bring that into the review of those types of special exception projects like um, site plan reviews, for example. Uh, is bird friendly glass part of that same bucket or is that a building or leads uh, certification? Because it would, would be nice to have uh, higher threat factors in, uh, in, in that bird friendly glass. Yeah, uh, it, it is. Well, let me. It is, and it is, um, it is part of that bucket, but it's also beyond that bucket. The, the document specifically calls out county contracts and facilities, for example, but it, it um, you know, similar limitations on like existing um, private properties. So, um, yeah, I, does that help answer the question? Well, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it, I guess like four years ago, state of the art might have been uh, 13 on the threat factor, but, but now, you know, we could do better than that. But I guess that's another road to, tr that's not part of this plan. That's some sort of county reg, I guess. Yeah, that's and that's the, you, you probably find most of the relevant information about that in the green building incentive policy upon oh, which okay, a lot thanks. of, yeah, thanks. upon which a, a lot of our recommendations um, in this section 3.5 of the FNRP are based. It's really like, hey, these are great ideas. Can we expand them to other, um, types of situations in the county beyond, you know, um, density incentives for specific types of projects. So that's uh, we're, we're tracking with with that policy. And and you have the part about mandatory planting native native plants in everybody's backyard. Is, is that <laughs> uh, not not quite, but I will not, refer not quite you there to yet. Uh, okay. 3. No, thank you. Thank you very much plants. for answering yeah. the questions. Most appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And and thank, thank you, you for tabling as well at the event, Colt. That was great. Thank you for representing us. Um, anyone else on the commission uh, have any questions for Ryan? Okay, hearing none. Thank you so much, Ryan. We will be in touch with you on um, next steps here. All right, awesome. Thank you yeah. for the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a presentation. Um, this is our final presentation, formal presentation for the evening. Um, so thank you all for staying up with us. And thank you to Brett for also uh, staying to the end. Um, so Brett is from C CPHD and we'll be talking about the food study, F-O-O-D study, um, which we will also be writing a letter on. And so I am. this is the one letter I don't already have a named writer for, so looking for um, some help here. Otherwise, I can always write it too. Um, and so I'm going to pass it over to Brett uh, to go ahead and give us um, the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Good evening. I just want to confirm real quick that you can see my screen. Yes, we can. All right, great. Thanks, Marco. So again, my name is Brett Wallace. I'm with the Planning Division Urban Design Team. And I'm here this evening to provide an update on the future of outdoor dining or the food study, one of our more playful acronyms that we have for studies uh, in the county. Um, so just quickly looking at the study schedule, um, staff launched the study last fall when the county manager removed the emergency order. Um, we kicked off with phase one where we were really doing a bunch of um, information gathering, reviewing the temporary outdoor seating areas or the TOSAs looking at our existing policies, looking at other communities, cities across the nation, because um, we're not the only ones doing this. <laughs> um, and then we also had some community engagement um, online feedback form where we received approximately 2,000 responses, so that was really good. And we hosted a couple of virtual roundtable events in the fall. And this was really just getting a temperature reading from the community on their experience with the, the temporary outdoor seating areas. And then looking into the winter springtime frame, uh, phase two, we continue to do some more information gathering. Um, the county board extended the continuity of governance ordinance or the COGO in January. So that'll be ending on August the 15th uh, this summer. And then we uh, used the information and the feedback that we received in both phase one and two to uh, 
inform a draft framework and recommendations that I'll be sharing with you in a minute. So we're currently in phase three. We are um, doing commission review and doing updates uh, to the outdoor cafe guidelines in addition to zoning ordinance uh, text amendments. Um, we just uh, last week, the county board uh, authorized advertisement of the public hearings for the planning commission and the county board in July. And again, just noting on the far right, the temporary outdoor seating program will be ending on August 5th, the 15th. And so uh, the timing is critical to get these new regulations in place uh, before then. Uh, so just a quick uh, overview of the study purpose and the goals. Um, again, looking at um, which aspects of the TOSA program could be could be uh, incorporated into the more permanent um, outdoor cafe program. We're also looking uh, to inform other changes to current regulations for how we manage outdoor cafes on both uh, public and private property. Um, and we want to create a clear pathway forward for the current uh, TOSA holders uh, looking to transition to the more permanent program. And so early on in the study, staff developed a set of art overarching study themes that you see on the bottom of this slide, including uh, looking at restaurants as a public good, uh, understanding that restaurants and outdoor cafes contribute to a vibrant streetscape and street life, restaurant recovery and res resiliency, looking at ways we could support uh, businesses to bounce back from any kind of losses um, that may have occurred over the pandemic. And then uh, looking at outdoor cafes and restaurants as different places and different spaces. It's it's not a one size fits all approach when it comes to outdoor cafes, and they really need to uh, work with the existing context. So before I go over the recommendations, I just want to cover um, existing zoning ordinance regulations and the, uh, guidance for outdoor cafes. So currently, um, uh, and also pre-pandemic. Um, Outdoor cafes could be approved on private property administratively by the zoning administrator. Um, however, outdoor cafes that are in the public right of way or sidewalks or public spaces like the example that you see uh, on the slide here, those would be approved by a uh, site plan or use permit approval by the county board. Some other applicable policies and regulations for outdoor cafes include the guidelines, which is an administrative document that was last updated in 2013. Um, the zoning ordinance, um, the Arlington County retail plan. Um, I'll speak to um, an action item in the retail plan that is also part of this, this effort in a minute when it comes to the licensing of outdoor cafes. Um, the master transportation plan, the pedestrian element uh, with regard to uh, clear sidewalks and pedestrian circulation and the public right of way and then the Public spaces master plan um, with regard to um, outdoor cafes, but also uh, uh, privately owned public spaces. We also have a number of other statewide uh, codes that are applicable, including the building code, fire prevention code, the Virginia ABC when it comes to um, the service of alcohol in outdoor cafes, and then guidance for tents and heaters and the encroachment ordinance um, into the public right of way, which I'll speak to speak about in a minute as well. So just a quick overview for those may be not familiar with the temporary outdoor seating areas or TOSAs. Uh, the TOSAs were established in, in 2020 to help with restaurants during the COVID-19 pandemic. This was uh, at a time when uh, dining inside a restaurant was not allowed, and so outdoor dining was the only option. So staff created a set of flexible uh, design and operational guidelines, and we developed a, a, an online submission process we had an interdepartmental uh, team of uh, staff to review, and all the TOSAs were approved and signed off by the county manager through the continuity of governance ordinance. So currently we have approximately 100 TOSAs that are still in operation today, uh, both on public and private property. And again, those TOSAs will be expiring um, on August the 15th. So just some images here kind of illustrating uh, some of the outdoor cafes and TOSAs that we have throughout the county. I think some of these examples probably illustrate more clearly, uh, or maybe not so clearly, the, the pedestrian clear zone and the clear sidewalk width. Uh, some of the examples that you can see is what we call cafe creep, where uh, cafes have expanded to create um, 
uh, pinch points some some uh, problems with navigating the sidewalk for persons with disabilities as well. So that's certainly an issue that we're looking to resolve as part of the recommendations. Uh, we also have some other examples of TOSAs in uh, private uh, off street parking spaces, like in the examples on the top of the screen where restaurants have converted. Um, you know, striped parking spaces into outdoor cafe spaces or patios. And then we have some cases um, as in Sherlington that you see on the bottom left where the, the TOSAs are taking up the entire sidewalk from the building face to the curb and the pedestrians. Um, the county installed these these wheel stops and bollards to um, provide a, a safe place for pedestrians to navigate around the outdoor cafes. Um, so going back to the engagement from phase one, again, what we heard um, with regard to the TOSAs primarily, um, we heard a lot of support for the local businesses. Overall, it just enjoyment of outdoor dining in general, um, but we also heard concerns about providing a safe accessible pedestrians uh, clear path like um, that was not shown in some of the previous images. Um, we did hear some support for uh, reduced parking for expanded outdoor dining for those examples that are using uh, off street parking spaces. Um, but above all, we heard um, the need to streamline the process, which is what we're uh, currently recommending um, that you'll see in a moment. Um, looking at the zoning ordinance amendments that are currently recommended by staff, um, the zoning ordinance amendments are uh, one of three uh, key elements of the recommended framework. Um, the first uh, is the zoning ordinance, um, and then the second is the encroachment ordinance or the outdoor cafe license. This is a, a new chapter of the county code that's uh, being led by the uh, real estate team, which includes an administrative process for outdoor cafes in the public right of way or public spaces with an application and a fee, uh, which is typically based on the square footage of the outdoor cafe. So the two of these items were subjects of the request to advertise last week. Um, and like I said earlier, the board authorized advertisements. So these two key elements are, are coming along together uh, to the board and planning commission next month. Um, so just a quick summary of the zoning ordinance amendments. Uh, one of the big uh, takeaways is um, we're looking to um, recommend permitting outdoor seating in public spaces uh, by administrative review by staff um, as opposed to being reviewed by the county board for use permit. Uh, use permits reviewed by the county board typically take on average a minimum of three months and they can cost a minimum of two thousand dollars or even more. Um, and then there's the public hearing. Uh, we found that uh, typically all the outdoor cafes that are on the county board agenda are on the consent agenda. They're all typically approved. So we really feel like this would really streamline the process and reduce time by the applicants and also staff resources um, to move to an administrative process. Um, we're also looking at the board, uh, the ability for the board to modify the parking requirements for those seats located in private parking spaces, like in some of those examples I shared earlier. And then we have some other amendments to further the study goals and recommendations. And then the third item um, I mentioned earlier is the outdoor cafe guidelines. This is an administrative document um, that requires no county board action. This is what I call an all in one kind of reference manual that will include. Uh, application and permitting process and step by step directions for restaurants who want to proceed with the application, including clear guidance for sidewalks. Um, pedestrian safety, ADA and accessibility and any reference to any other fire or building codes um, required. So uh, in terms of our recommendations, um, this table here summarizes the existing standards um, and then the proposed that you see in the, the column on the right um, that's highlighted. So currently, as I mentioned earlier, for the private property, those um, outdoor cafes are reviewed administratively by the zoning administrator. We're looking to for no changes there. We're, we're currently recommending that those outdoor cafes continue to be reviewed administratively. And like I mentioned on the previous slide, for the public rights away or the public Easements on private property, um, including privately owned public spaces or POPs, um, those are currently reviewed by county board use permit, and we're uh, recommending to move those into the administrative uh, review process as well. Um, and then for the third item, the, the POPs, the, the privately owned public spaces, 
Um, those are currently reviewed by the county board uh, by use permit. And again, we're looking to continue that practice to give us uh, more um, authority on the review of those spaces um, that you'll see in a minute. I have a couple of examples. So um, with regard to the privately owned public spaces, um, the PSMP adopted in 2019 includes a, a definition for privately owned public space um, that's uh, noted here. The POPs are typically dedicated and, rec and recorded with a deed of public access easement um, by site plan condition. Uh, currently, throughout the county, we have approximately 75 POPs uh, that totals up to approximately 800,000 square feet or roughly 18 acres. Um, we also have uh, design guidelines for POPs that are part of the PSMP as well. Uh, some additional policy guidance from the PS PSMP with regard to outdoor cafes. Um, notes that um, they may be appropriate in certain contexts, but they should be thought of early in the design process and not uh, an afterthought or retrofitted uh, through a later program. And then encourages the activation of POPs um, through one-off events uh, rather than permanent outdoor seating. These are just a couple of examples in the county um, of outdoor cafes that have been approved in POPs uh, by use permit approval by the county board. Uh, with regard to the clear sidewalk, um, the diagrams that you see on the left uh, depict the uh, the six foot minimum clear sidewalk that's been in place for quite some time. Um, we're currently looking to recommend to bring that forward as part of the new regulations. Uh, these diagrams illustrate the the proper uh, clear path and uh, a clear path that uh, is typically discouraged with uh, re regard to jogs and zigzags on the sidewalk. And these diagrams are from the 2013 design guidelines. And just the images on the right just illustrate uh, when it's applied correctly and when it's not. So uh, just summarizing quickly um, the proposed zoning amendments uh, to Article 12, which is outdoor cafes. Um, again, the, the amendments are reflecting proposed changes to the approval process. I mentioned the private property. Um, the ability for the board to modify the parking requirements on private property by use permit. And then for the public property, um, mostly sidewalks. There'll be a requirement um, if adopted in July for the those type of outdoor cafes to obtain an outdoor cafe license, which is the new chapter 70 of the county code. Uh, those cafes will also need to meet the, the zoning ordinance use standards. The clear sidewalk dimension of six feet. Um, unless otherwise approved as part of a site plan condition if 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 greater distance uh, the location in front of the restaurant and then uh, provision uh, to uh, prohibit sound and entertainment when when adjacent to uh, residential properties and then like i mentioned for the the pops those would also uh, need to get a use permit approval by the county board in addition to getting an outdoor cafe license um, and they would also need to meet the zoning or its uh, use standards in addition to other guidelines as, as mentioned previously in the, the PSMP. There are also some other text changes we're recommending to other articles in the zoning ordinance, including some of the use tables for the commercial and industrial districts. Uh, these again are just editorial changes to reflect um, the proposed approval process. Uh, Article 14 parking again, more uh, editorial changes to resolve some uh, conflicts uh, with allowing outdoor cafes and off street parking spaces. Um, currently, the zoning ordinance um, only permits the parking of vehicles in parking spaces and that no other uh, use can be permitted within a parking space. So again, some changes uh, there to that text and then the requirement for the use permit approval by the county board uh, for those type of cases. And then staff is also recommending a new definition in the zoning ordinance for uh, the POPs or the public space that's privately owned. And again, we're recommending um, this to distinguish uh, the POPs from other public easement areas such as sidewalks. And again, requiring a use permit uh, for the outdoor cafe, which is uh, the current practice today. Uh, so just briefly, um, I mentioned the county code chapter several times. This was identified in the Arlington retail plan in 2015. Um, there was actually a, an action item in the implementation plan that encourages 
Uh, the administrative license process to use the public right of way. This is something that a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions uh, and uh, jurisdictions throughout the uh, county and the country do today. Um, so this is being led by the um, Department of Environmental Services real estate team, um, and it'll be coming forward to the board uh, next month um, as well. And so again, this is the, the licensing for the private use of the public space. Um, there'll be an administrative review process application, uh, an annual renewal, uh, uh, including an application fee uh, that's typically based on the square footage. And again, this would be in addition to any other requirements for cafes under the, the zoning ordinance. And again, these recommendations are coming forward with the food study recommendations. Um, so in terms of commission review, we've been busy uh, over the past month meeting with uh, the zoning committee uh, twice, transportation commission, uh, pedestrian advisory. We've met um, actually a couple of times with the Chamber of Commerce, economic development. Um, I mentioned last week the county board authorized advertisement for the zoning ordinance amendments and the encroachment ordinance. And we're with you all this evening and we'll be going back to transportation commission for action uh, later this month uh, before going to the planning commission and the county board in July. And so um, we've been thinking a lot about what's going to happen after the July County Board meeting uh, with regard to TOSA's. Uh, we're, we're conducting uh, some in-person direct engagement with restaurant owners who currently have TOSA's. Um, we're doing you know some targeted outreach to uh, different restaurants um, depending on their situation. Some have site plans, some have use permits, some are on private property, uh, some People just opened up during the pandemic and currently all they have is a TOSA. So how do we bring work with them to, to get the necessary permits um, for the permanent program? Um, so we're looking uh, that restaurants would be filing um, applications by August 15th, which is the end of the continuity of governance ordinance. Um, and then we're looking, uh, we've got an interdepartmental staff team that'll be reviewing applications with an estimated time frame of 90 to 120 days. Uh, after August the 15th, with um, any decisions made on uh, administrative reviews or use permit applications towards the latter part of the year um, in the November, December timeframe, which is typically the end of the outdoor dining season. So um, just including a link to the project uh, website, which includes uh, all the presentations from all the commissions that uh, we've presented to, including uh, the staff report and the zoning ordinance text amendment document that was presented uh, to the county board last week. And my contact information is here. If if we don't have time to get all the questions or comments in, uh, you can always uh, reach out to me via email. So thank you. Thank you so much, Brett. Turning my camera on. Great. Um, all right. Well, I was taking notes um, and I'm glad that we have that presentation online as well for us to refer to. Um, but I think that, you know, not just because of the regulation ending in August, this is long, long, long overdue in my opinion um, for us to both have guidance on it and to correct some whatever trials that were made during the pandemic period. Um, I think we've seen a lot of value of this. Um, I think that there's some biophilic elements that we can speak to even here. Um, so yeah, uh, um, that's my two cents. We'll, we will be writing a letter on this. So thank you very much for presenting. Um, I see a couple of hands up, so I'm gonna start calling on names. Please raise your hand if you wanna comment on this um, topic or have any questions for Brett. Um, so yes, Colt, go ahead. I will yield to Melissa uh, first, so I don't take the trifecta in being first. <laughs> Okay, right. okay. Yeah. Melissa, go ahead. Yes. Got it. Um, so uh yeah, again, long overdue. I really agree with Shruti here. Um, I particularly like the part of taking back the taking back using the parking spaces for people instead of cars. Um, Shruti, you'd mentioned the biophilic elements. Um, is that what you're referring to? Like the planters that would be sometimes in these things? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, can I'd say like there's something we can say here about connecting the streetscapes to maybe plantings or natural elements co-located or nearby that kind of connect that naturalistic yeah. element. Yeah. So I was thinking more abstractly, but yes. 
Yes, well, if that could be, you know, further included, maybe some, I don't know, uh, further discussion on, uh, you know, what people do with these spaces, if they put tables and chairs or perhaps things that blocks the street from the road, I forget the name for it, but like those being planters instead of just those concrete slabs would be interesting to discuss. But yeah, overall, really love this way overdue. And now I will see you to Colt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so I was wondering if this is applying to, uh, we're talking about publicly owned private spaces and you said 18 acres and is that 18 acres of, of publicly owned private space everywhere or only, you know, in Arlington or was that only uh, in the, with that the uh, initiative, the future for outdoor dining had considered. And that's for Brent. Yeah, I was uh, referring to spaces that are privately owned with a public access easement. Right. And yes, currently we have approximately, I think I had 88 of those that were roughly 18 acres when you total the square footage of all of them together. Yeah. Um, and those are all throughout the county. No. Um, so well, we so my concern with that is we fight really hard to get whatever green space we can in those publicly owned private spaces. And then to, and I don't know if this is correct, but it seems like, oh, well, now we're just going to see back much of that or uh, for dining purposes. So you think about the, the water park in Crystal City and, and the kiosks that used to be park space there. Uh, and you wonder about losing some of that green space to a dining area that's going to be used in the summer and then when you walk by it in the winter there's nothing there except those rails anyway i, I might be off base on that am i out of the i'm not clear on this enough on this concept but that's my concern Understood. yeah i think with the case with the water park i do believe that was private with no public easement, but I think through this redesign, if you will, um, there will be a public access easement over it now, but I don't think there was previously. But I think, you know, going back to the PSMP, I mean, we want to think about these things early on in the process so that if there is any areas that are um, where developers want to carve out for outdoor cafes, that those are not part of the dedicated public easement area. And so th that's what we we like to do. Um, and it looks like Marco may uh, have some additional points to add there. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, so I just wanted to clarify. So with the water park, um, I believe we will be receiving a park easement for that area where which previously was not the case as as Brett indicated. However, I believe the area that will be carved out for that park easement will exclude any areas um, associated with those proposed kiosks within that space. But I can provide the commission an update on that once we receive that final park easement, which I believe will be later on this this fall. I, I guess I was I mean, I appreciate that. I was just thinking of an off the cuff example, but it seems that we have all we in particularly in Crystal City where we negotiate the walkthroughs and now we've got the green ribbon going through and now I can see the green ribbon lined with dining spaces as opposed to being green space that we could use and enjoy on a stroll. So maybe I've got the wrong idea here, but it really frightens me to have this the publicly owned private spaces being able to encroach on walkways and and things. Uh, and maybe take away the green space that we negotiated to begin with. And I think the study should include like, you know, what are the known parameters as the touch points here? And so I think like to Colt's point, the criticism isn't so much on the study itself, but as to the regulations that may encompass the study's parameters and safeguards on its side, for example, let's make sure that there is something in mind to protect the green spaces that we've already allotted through other programs. Uh, thanks, for, that was my concern, Trudy, Th thank you. That was much better said than I said. Well, I just think that's like an element here that yeah. I think like the study should include what, is the, what are the boundaries? Basically. Thanks. Yeah, awesome. Anyone else had any other questions on the food study? 
If not, thank you very much, Brett. Um, we look forward sure. to hearing back from you with the study results, of course, um, and appreciate yeah, you guys coming to us again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Guys, we're actually doing pretty great on time as well, and I think that's great. Um, and so we're probably going to end at nine, which is good, um, or maybe a little bit after. Um, Marco, I'm going to hand it over to you for the staff report. I don't think there's anything in particular, but just want to mention it. Sure. Um, no specific updates to the staff report that was conveyed to the commission last week. However, I did want to update the commission that we will be meeting in August um, as part of our you know, scheduled field trip. Um, we uh, have identified the location as being the renovated Alcova Heights uh, Park. Joshua Surik, um, who is a DPR landscape architect within PDD, our Park Development Division, will be leading that walking tour. Um, we're thinking about starting that, that uh, walking tour around 6 p.m. Uh, we're still uh, finalizing that date, whether it will be August 15th or August 22nd. Um, We'll, we'll provide the commission an update on that, hopefully by the July PRC meeting. Um, and we're also um, potentially inviting NRJAG members to attend this uh, this walking tour. So it should be a lot of fun. Um, it's right off of uh, the Columbia Pike corridor every, um, area as well. So if commission members or other folks want to go out for you know a bite or a drink, you know that's always an option as well. I say yes to doing that first of all. Um, if you guys are down after. The August meeting. We of course will have our July meeting in person um, at the government center. But um, so yes, we're inviting Energy to it. The determination between those two dates, we heard from our last meeting that there wasn't too much um, differentiation between the two dates. And so um, Marco is going to be reaching out to Takis's team as well as Jane um, Rudolph, uh, head of DPR to see if either of them can join on either of those dates. And then we'll circulate that with Energy too. Just to think more the merrier, why not? Um, and then a reminder that during the August meeting, we really don't cover very much besides um, the meeting minutes and mm -hmm. the actual um, event. We can talk about other things if we need to, for example, if a letter comes up or something, but I don't think that we're in that period right now looking at our July meeting. Right. Good. And typically we would handle all of that business right at the beginning. So, you know, we can certainly do that and then right afterwards move on with the with the tour. So, yeah, we will get back to you on that if there are any changes. Um, thank you for those who have submitted um, commissioner member reports. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time next meeting talking about some of those. Um, namely, Melissa, I'd like to get an update on the Bill Thomas Award from staff. Um, and so. Yeah, uh, I'm going to skip that for t this time being but um, and move to other business. But we have a light July meeting, which is in person. And so we can talk about, you know, staff or sorry, commissioner appointments and reports at that time. Um, OK, other business. So um, we have a four items five items that have a little bit of a time sensitivity to them. And then we have one that is kind of ongoing and you'll see we would have one more, but I have omitted it from the list. So let me start with that. Um, Commissioner Harnick, Peter, has decided not to rejoin the commission um, for another term. And so I'm dropping the Quincy Park letter from this list um, because I know that's like a one of his points that's, you know, kind of harder to get consensus on. Um, I'm just trying to be visible about that. Um, I encouraged Peter. He couldn't join us tonight. He had um, he's on vacation with his family, actually. Um, and, but I encouraged him to write a letter to the commission um, just saying his goodbye. I encouraged him to bring his ideas continually to um, our community. Uh, and so just giving you that awareness. Um, we I, we've also already talked about this, that Cole is going to be stepping down in September. Um, we have a couple, everyone else who has endings this year has chosen to stay on, we will, but we will be back down to just having 12 commissioners on um, full time. And so um, we'll be looking to fill seats. Uh, if you have friends or if you know someone who you think would be a good fit, um, please encourage them to apply. Um, so that's just a ploy for that one. Uh, and now I'm going to go into order. So starting with the Highview Park Diamond 
field renaming um, letter. I'm going to take that one on. Can I get volunteers potentially for the edit editing committee for that one? I'll be sending out an email to everyone with um, that draft. Sure, I'll be happy to, to help with that. Mr. Thank Adam. you, Adam. Um, anyone else? Adam, you're going to be writing a letter too, so feel free to take yourself off of some of these things um, if you want. Uh, anyone else being I would be down for an editing position on that renaming letter? It should be an easy one, basically just saying like, yeah, makes sense. Trudy, if you need somebody, I can do it. This is Jill. Oh, I see a couple of new people. I see a couple of people. Dean, I'm going to put you on that one if that's okay. Thank you. I'll send out an email to that committee tomorrow. Um, okay, next we have the ARVA site plan. Adam, I was kind of thinking that since you're our commissioner representative on this project, it would be great if you would write the letter, um, but also happy to get other opinions if you would rather not. Uh, no, that makes sense. Okay, awesome. And would, I, would anyone like to be on the ARVA letter? Um, yeah, Marco, please go ahead. No, and I uh, just wanted to let Adam know <laughs> that um, we did receive quite an extensive presentation from um, the development team earlier on so uh, once the video is posted you'll be able to review that content at that time and i'll also share um, any pdf presentations to the commission probably within the next day or so okay great thanks yeah i i, sh I hope that i know most of that stuff but yeah i think you do <laughs> hope there weren't too many surprises yeah. but uh, thank you for reminding me yeah no and i think it's a lot of praise mostly and then pushing for more transparency on items that we're not getting as part of the 4.1 site plan but you know, yes. Um, would anyone like to be on the editing committee? I will be on this editing committee for Arva. I can help. This is Sarah. Sarah, thank you. Okay, that's minimum. But would anyone else like to join on that one? We've got two uh, more. It'll be fun. It'll be lots of fun. Yep. Okay, Alex, Nelson. thank you. Oh, and Nelson, great. Yep. Thank you, guys. All right, I'll set up a letter uh, email for that tomorrow as well. Um, all right, the food study. I don't have a letter writer in mind for this. Um, and I think that this is actually also a fairly simple letter. It's really providing praise for the study um, and maybe mentioning some of the things that were brought up today, like making sure that the known um, policies are being adhered to and acknowledged as part of the study process, things like that. Um, it should be a fairly straightforward letter. Um, we've got a few other letters and one that's being written by Jill and one that's likely to be written by Sarah. So can I get someone else to write this letter, the food study letter? Anyone? All right, OK, I will draft this one. Can I get someone to uh, two people for the editing for this food study one? It should be pretty easy. I can help edit. It's okay. Melissa. Melissa, thank you. Anyone else? I, I can take I, this. I can help. This is Jill. OK. Thank you, Jill. All right, two more. Um, next one is uh, the Bingham Center slash Silver Diner site plan and really the changes that are going on with that. Um, Sarah, you've been the one overseeing this project, right? Yeah, that's right. Would you be open to writing the letter for this one? Um, we, I see this one as having the same July 15th deadline, unfortunately. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right. Silver Diner. And I can be an M. I'll be an editor on this one as well. Um, can I get at least one other person for this one? I can do that since I was the backup on that one. I'll, I'll be happy. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. Anyone else want to be on the Silver Diner project? Letter. All right. OK, we've got one more, a big one. This is the FNRP. Um, so Jill will be writing this letter. Thank you very much, Jill, for writing this letter. 
Um, we've already started an editorial committee, have we? I, I can't remember, actually. Um, we have at least Sarah and Colt. <laughs> Sarah and Colt, yeah. Right? So then I think right? Is Sarah on? I asked Sarah about yes. it, but I didn't hear back. I'm on. I can help with that one. Um, okay. are, are you willing to do the part on the legislation? Sure, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. So we're hoping, I'm hoping to get a first draft out tomorrow uh, to the editing team and then uh, hoping we can circulate it to everybody. Um, well, wonderful. deadline. <clears throat> wonderful. So I think I'm good on this one for right now. Let's see um, where we go. Great. Colt, did you want to? I was just wondering what the timing is on that. If it doesn't go to the board until I know. a long time. So I, I just I don't know. That, yeah, after talking with Ryan, we think that it's best that it go July by June 30th, by June, the end of okay. the period. And that is so that if Ryan's going to be coming out with some summary documents of the public engagement process, it would be great for our comments if they can be echoed by other comments from the community oh. or included in that wrap up. And in order to get him the data on time, we should get it by the end of the public comment period. Okay. He's nope. saying he's willing to acknowledge it well into July. He even mentioned August, but let's get it to him as soon as possible to make it easy. I know C2E2 will be sending it a little bit later. So let's get ours earlier. Also, Jill, I just think um, when you send out that first draft to the editorial committee, Colt, Sarah, myself, and you. CC, Phil Klingenhofer, Carolyn. Okay. Let's get all of the usual suspects in that so that they have that first draft. Okay. I don't know, really. Yeah. And then the topics, I don't know, for whoever else is interested, are very, very much the same as the same ones we've all been talking about. And Colt, you're willing to do the one on biophilia, right? You're going to write that up. Yeah. yeah, and I've got some comments in some other areas, and you know, I'll, I'll give you what I got, and people can take it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, you might want to hold the other areas until you see the draft, but it's up to you. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's it's mostly some of them are cross cutting, so it's hard to. I know. I yeah. know the whole thing is a big. Morale. All right, I, I understand what you want me to do. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Okay, good. So that's good. All right. Um, we talked about potentially writing a pickleball letter specifically on um, some ideas going on um, within the pickleball community. I'd say we table that for right now based on, you know, workload. There's a lot going on right now, and we've just had a pickleball conversation with um, staff as well. So we'll table that for right now. Um, thank you, Mark, for your time and thinking about that as well. I think I, I agree with your analysis. Um, and so that is really where we stand on letter writing. I will be sending out an email to the folks who signed up for these letters tomorrow morning. Um, so we should be good on that. And all the letters will have a drafting date uh, for those first drafts to be due by, let's say, the 30th of June, and that way we can try and get them edited and out well before the 15th, the board meeting. For FNRP, that's running completely differently. We won't, I won't be sending out an email specifically on that. We already have a chain going. We've got a good cadence going there. So look forward to seeing Jill's draft in final form uh, before the 30th of June. All right. Any other topics? Uh, we have eight minutes. All right. If not, uh, I just want to remind everyone we will be in person um, to meet quorum next meeting on July 18th. Um, we will be meeting in the Cherry Conference Room, which is 216, that like corner back room. Is actually, that the one that will not be in Cherry? Actually, um, there, there was. Um... A scheduling or actually no not for july sorry i think that'll be for september where we're where we've identified the scheduling conflict so yes july we will be meeting in cherry okay wonderful okay all right okay well thank you all for joining today and we will see you next month and thank you all for your participation in these letters coming up this month. Uh, I know it's a lot but uh, summer is when we do these things so thank you all um Thanks, Freddie.
All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night.